This is the Sales Gravy Podcast. I'm Jeb Blunt, best-selling author of Fanatical Prospecting Sales EQ, Objections, and Inc., and I'm here to help you open more doors, close bigger deals, and rock your commission check. On this episode, I spend some time with Sherilyn Castleman, the author of the brand new book called What's in the Cards, and I'll let her explain to you what the book is all about. In our conversation, we take on empathy, diversity, and post-pandemic selling. It's a wonderful conversation, and I really enjoyed spending time with Sherilyn, and I know that you'll enjoy this too. In fact, I liked it so much that following our podcast interview, I invited her to be a speaker at this year's Outbound Conference. And if you don't have tickets to Outbound, you want to go right now to outboundconference.com. That's outboundconference.com and check out all the tickets, both in person and virtual. It's an event you don't want to miss. Before we get started, there's this app that I've absolutely fallen in love with. It's called Vidyard, and I use it every single day and so do my salespeople. You see, Vidyard makes it insanely easy to send video messages to our prospects. Email is boring, but video, wow, video makes you stand out. And it gives you an incredible competitive edge. Right now, you can go try Vidyard absolutely free. And there are no strings attached. It's free. Just go to vidyard.salesgravy.com. That's V-I-D-Y-A-R-D dot com forward slash salesgravy. Now, here's my conversation with Sherilyn Castleman. Hi, this is Jeff Blunt. We are back on the Sales Gravy Podcast, coming to you from the Sales Gravy Clubhouse with Sherilyn Castleman, the author of a brand new book called What's in the Cards. And what we're going to be talking about today are proven strategies for post-pandemic sales success. And Sherilyn's got a deep, deep, deep background in sales. And I'm not going to talk to talk to you about Sherilyn because I'm going to let her do it herself. But uh, Sherilyn, why don't you tell us a little bit about where you came from, how you got to this place, and and why people should pay attention to you? Absolutely, Jeb. Jeb, I've been selling since Girl Scout cookies were less than a dollar. So I've been in the sales business for a long time. For more than 20 years, I've helped Fortune 500 companies as a global sales executive. So I know firsthand what it takes to succeed in sales. I've also an experienced entrepreneur. So I know about the dedication, passion, and grit it takes to make your dreams a reality. And as a wife and mother, I know about the challenges of trying to balance it all um, and have family and a career. I'm, today, I am the chief learning officer for Sisters in Sales. We work to empower women of color through networking and training, and we partner with companies that want to increase their pipeline with more diversity by hiring black and brown um, women sales professionals. But I love the fact that you're trying to build more diversity. And when I think about the sales teams that I've been on that were the best, like the most powerful, it was when we had people that came from every different place, different colors, different creeds, different backgrounds, different ages, different ways of thinking. That's what made us stronger and it made us a lot better. And, um, and in fact, I always think that those teams were the most competitive teams to be on because everybody was sort of jockeying to see who's going to be number one. Right. Um, absolutely. And especially now coming out of the pandemic. So um, Harvard Business Review did a study in May of 2020. And they said that in B2B sales, women outperform men. In sales leadership, women outperform men. And they identified about four or five different characteristics that women have on why we are incredible at sales. And coming out of the financial crisis in 2008, women outperformed men in B2B sales. So I stepped back and I looked at this and I said, someone was teasing me. I was doing some coaching and training. They said, so are you saying guys need to learn to sell like a woman or are they going to get left behind? And I said, well, you know, the facts don't lie. And so I wrote this book to kind of share some of these tips and tricks with everybody who's looking at how do I sell coming out of the pandemic as I'm reimagining and reinventing what should I be doing? I've competed against women my entire life as a sales professional. And, you know, and I always know that if my competitor is a woman and I'm in a deal, I have to work harder. Because the, most women have a little bit more empathy than men do naturally. Like you just, you, I think you just, you just come to the table with that. And empathy, especially when you get into complex sales, when you're working with a lot of stakeholders, empathy is a meta skill. 
So women, I just think, are better at asking questions and listening, which are like really, if we start thinking about the heart of sales, it's discovery and it's the ability to get below the surface. And men sometimes, I mean, and I'm just like, I'm saying this about men, but I know it, like we just don't always pay attention and we don't always listen. We're always more focused on what we want to say. And I think that I think that just gives women a natural uh, competitive advantage in the sales world. And you said something else, and I'm just going to comment on this, the balance piece. Many women that I know that are in sales, many women are single moms because Mm -hmm. sales gives them the greatest opportunity to make a high income and still be able to balance their family. But it's because they have to balance family that they're more efficient in their sales day. So they end up getting way more done. So men who don't always have that. And I know this, like I go home, I've been married. My wife and I've been together since high school. So we've been together for a really long time. But I know the burden that I leave behind me as a man because she picks up the pieces that that I let her pick up because I'm, you know, I'm focused on me. So, So when she comes to work, she's our CFO, right? So when she comes to work, she has to work like she has to compress all that in a shorter period of time. So I think, you know, I think that Harvard's exactly right. So here's a, here's another question for you. I know this wasn't the subject you want to talk about, but I'm fascinated by this. Okay. Why aren't there more women of color in sales? Um, so Ursula Burns, um, the former CEO of um, Xerox, at the time, um, she was the only African-American CEO of a Fortune 500 company. And as she was stepping down and moving on to her next position, when they interviewed her, they talked about what was her observation. And she said, women of color tend to go into marketing, HR, or the arts, and that we need to go where the juice is. And the juice is where the product and the money is. And that's what sales is. And that's why I started sales coaching and sales training because I wanted women to know you sell every day, master it, get good at it and build, you know, build wealth. Like you said, provide for your children in a way that you can't other than with sales a lot of times. And so um, it's, it's tough. So for a lot of women, you can, you're the only woman. So I've never been on a sales team where I wasn't the only person of color or the only woman, except for those that I had hired. So you end up being a trailblazer. And what that means is instead of just selling, you're skinning your elbows and your knees while you claw your way and you're a trailblazer. Well, not everybody's cut out to be a trailblazer. So I tell women today, if you're going to go into sales, look at the team, look at the interview process and look at the website. If there aren't people that look like you, know that you're going to be a trailblazer. Be intentional. Know that you're going to have to have that fight. If not, go someplace where they hire people that look like you. So for years, it was being a trailblazer. And so it's not just doing your job, it's dealing with being a trailblazer as well as the microaggressions. And microaggressions are those little things that people say and do that they may not realize it, but it hurts. It, 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 it stings, it upsets you. And you say, do I wanna deal with this? And a lot of women don't. And so, you know, you deal with that. Um, you deal with um, just the, um, the sexual misconduct that happens when you're on a team with a lot of males and they start drinking or you're with clients. And it is it, it can be a tough career for women. At least it was years ago when I started. It's much better. There are a lot of companies today that are focused on diversity and inclusion and they're doing everything they can to get it right. And what I say is, you know, go to companies that value you. Go to companies that appreciate you. Um, you know, there are still... There are still companies that have this male dominated um, kind of culture. It is changing. A lot of companies are changing and kudos to the companies that are. Um, But but like I tell women, there are great companies out there. There are great industries. Um, Sisters in Sales has partnered with some incredible companies. Um, One of them is Keep Trucking. They are um, doing, uh, they're converting, uh, they have a new SaaS app where they're converting um, clipboards to SaaS tools for truckers. It's an amazing industry. Um, and so, you know, so it, it now is the time for women to go into sales, succeed in sales, master the skills. You can have a good time at it. And you hit it on the head. Empathy is what is needed coming out of the pandemic. And men have to learn to be empathetic because we all, everything has changed. Think about your clients in 2019. Everything you know about your client has changed. Everything we know about customer behavior has changed. So we as salespeople have to change. We have to be empathetic. We have to take that discovery call 
And what I talk about is, I don't know about you, um, Jeb, when you first started selling, but I was taught spend 20% of your time kind of building relationships, 80% of your time selling. That has flipped. We now have to spend 80% of our time connecting with our clients and 20% of our time solutioning. If you spend time connecting with your client during those discovery calls, you're not selling, you are solutioning. Understand how they have changed, understand how their needs have changed and be there to solution with them. That's what I talk about. That's what I teach my clients and that's what they succeed in sales with. And you're exactly right. And you know, we see the same thing. 80% of the sales process is asking questions and listening and relating. And uh, the way we say it is there's five questions that every customer is asking about you in every interaction. Do I like you? Do you listen to me? Do you make me feel important? Do you mm -hmm. understand me? Like, do you get me in my problems and do I trust and believe you? And when you answer those five questions in the affirmative, it becomes almost impossible for them not to advance to the next step or do business with you. Right. And and I think I do believe, and I think you're exactly right. The one thing about the pandemic that has changed is that we're going to be moving way faster. We're going to be using multiple ways of communicating. And the, the competitive differentiation is going to be how well you build those emotional connections using all of the different channels that we have available to us. And the buyer is telling us, McKinsey just came out with a beautiful report about B2B sales behaviors. The buyers have, are telling us that they have changed. Yeah. And the salespeople are holding back. The salespeople are still going, you know, but I think we could do this. I'm like, no, no, we, you're telling me what you want to do. Right. Not what your buyer wants. Right. It's, it's, it's all about LinkedIn did, uh, has done a whole series called Buyers First. And if you don't put your buyer first and their needs first, nothing else is going to happen. And that's what, you know, and, 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 I, and I chuckle because when I first started, um, I, I teach a lot of live classes. And when I moved to virtual, I was looking for a virtual coach. And everybody kept coming on selling me, selling me. Nobody, nobody connected with me. Nobody talked about what my pain was, what my needs were. It was everything about, oh, I can do this and I do this. And I said, you guys aren't getting it. And so that's when I decided I have to share what I know. I have to share what women have learned. Women know how to be collaborative. So what's in a card stands for collaborative. It stands for analytical. It stands for relationships. It stands for development, being open-minded and being strategic. You build out those skills, you'll become empathetic, you'll become a better listener, and you will succeed. And, and, and so I teach people how to be empathetic listeners. Um, and, you know, in sales, we will learn to, to be reflective listeners. Somebody will say, I'm sad, you go, oh, you're sad. We can reflect, you know, we can reflect back all day. But being an empathetic listener means you have to quiet your brain and you have to be present with somebody, which means you may have to be a little vulnerable. And that was never okay in sales especially for a man. You were not allowed to come to the table and be vulnerable. How do you learn how to do that now? And that's what it's about, is you have to slow down, quiet your brain, and learn to listen to people and connect with people and be okay with being a little vulnerable. So, so I mean, isn't it about, like, when you start thinking about listening, when you think about, ref, you know, reflective listening, right? So, spitting things back to each other. And right. I think probably early on in your career, you went to those those classes where you would spit all that back. Right. I mean, isn't it really more about like deep listening where you're you're paying attention to your intuition and and you're listening with, and especially on video, for example, you know, listening with your eyes and listening with your ears and listening with your heart. And where I, I think that, that it's, a, it's about following those emotional cues that you're hearing from your buyer and asking deeper questions around that. What I see from salespeople is that the, the, I see the buyer being vulnerable, like the buyer right. is showing something. And, and it's not always like they come out and they're explicitly vulnerable, but they they show something in their body language that says this this either this is something that's important to me or this is something that's painful to me or this is something I'm thinking about. And the salesperson, instead of chasing that down, just they 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 they, they go they around sell. it because they well, 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 they're afraid yeah. that, they're even afraid that there might be conflict there that. It, versus like, you know, just going, hey, it sounds to me like that's something that's really important to you. Can you tell me a little bit more about that so I can, you know, so I can understand it? How do you like, how do you teach people to do that? And let me, I'm going to give you a, 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 a bigger question. So okay. how do you teach the people that you work with in coach um, okay. to, to be an empathetic listener, to be a deep listener, to really step into focusing on their buyer and learning their buyer's language, and which I think is super important to solving problems. Like, do you understand me? Do you get me? And I always teach people like that get relationship, a person that totally gets you, that's the most important relationship in your life. And you can have that with buyers because if you can demonstrate that you really understand them. 
but but getting people in in the virtual world so we're on video or we're on the telephone or we're even on social media and we're typing to each other web right. chat whatever it is if you're the salesperson how do you teach people and coach people to be that type of a listener so so the first thing i do is like there are three types of listening and we touched on a little bit on both of them. The first one is what I call level one listening or restaurant listening. You know, Jeb, you go into a restaurant and they say, do you want steak or salmon? And you immediately go, I had steak earlier this week. I might want salmon. We're talking in our head as much as the re the, the waiter's talking. That's level one listening. Level two is reflective listening, which we all of us learned for many years in sales. But level three listening is listening between the words. And what I tell people to do is what's called box breathing. I want you to take a deep breath in, hold it four counts, blow it out four counts, and hold that down four counts. If you do that once, your blood pressure comes down, your heart rate slows down, and all that chatter in your head quiets down. You can then listen to what's not being said. You're listening to between the words. You're listening for tone. You're, li you're looking at body language. Even if you're on the phone, you can hear somebody, and you can pause and say, hey, What's going on? You know, they may have their toddler under their desk. They may be dealing with a, an elderly parent that's in a nursing home that they can't see because of COVID. They may have just been notified that half the team is going to be ripped. Connect with what's going on. Everybody is going through something or has been through something because of this pandemic. Everybody has been touched. Connect with people. Allow yourself to be vulnerable. So that's number one. I just, I say, just slow down a little bit. Bring your heart rate down and just listen and listen between the words. That's number one. Number two, treat your Zoom like somebody is coming into your living room. Be the first one on, be the last one off. Um, welcome them into your Zoom like that you're welcoming into somebody into your home. If you're welcoming somebody into your home, you connect with them. I always start my Zoom calls with, hey, Jeb, you know what? One of the things that I like to make the best in my kitchen is reservations um, because I don't cook. And so, you know, we've all, and, and so they smiled just like you did. And what it did was it just made you feel just a little bit better, didn't it? Right. Okay. So I always start by making people chuckle or smile. Doesn't matter what you say. Then I ask them. So we've been, we've been in this pandemic for a year. I know you've had different cooking and dining experience. Jeb, what's the, what's the best dining or cooking experience you've had since you've been home? People start talking about, oh, my kids made cookies or we've always been make sushi, we made sushi. And they talk about something that makes them feel good. So that's number two, connect with people. After you're listening, make them smile. Number three, when I ask discovery questions, I start with the four Fs. What was it like the very first time you were back in the office? What was it like the very first time you called in clients? Whatever your first pandemic experience was, you learned real quickly, what was that? The next one is I asked them, what was your failure? What was your biggest failure since this pandemic? If that's the bane of their existence. The third F is what was your finest? What was the best thing that's been happened at work around whatever you're selling? What's the finest? And the last one is what is the future? If you could, if we could do anything, what would your future look like around this? Do you know what you have now? You have somebody who's already told you, this is where they're going. They want a solution with you. You have connected with them. You've made them smile. You made them feel good. You know where it hurts. You know what they're, they're, they're proud of, what was their finest. And you also know what their future looks like. If you don't have a solution, you can be a resource and find a solution for them. But that's what I teach people. Your discovery interview, connect with people, and make them feel good and treat them like they're coming into your home. What a great conversation. We'll be back to Cheryl in just a moment, but first I wanna tell you a short story. So we have this high value prospect that we really wanna connect with and we cannot get them to engage. It's like everything we sent them goes into a black hole. Email, voicemail, social media, even snail mail, sending them letters, they didn't respond to anything. So one day I grabbed my phone, I opened up the Vidyard app, I shot a quick video, just a short 30 second video, and I asked them for a meeting and I sent it to them. And seven minutes later, seven minutes later, I got a response and I set the meeting. And we ended up closing that deal and it was a big deal that helped us make our number last quarter. That's why I love Vidyard and I love video messaging because it works, it helps you stand out, and it gives you a decisive competitive edge. 
When you use Vidyard, you can send messages that are memorable, that allow you to, the, to show your personality, like I, I, putting a face with a name with a real human being. And because all those messages are personalized, it increases the probability that your prospect is going to engage exponentially. And here's the good news. You can try Vidyard for free. That's free, free, no strings attached. Just go to vidyard.com forward slash sales gravy. That's vidyard.com forward slash sales gravy. Now let's get back to my conversation with Sherilyn Castleman. So I want to dial into this and I want to dial this back to our conversation on diversity earlier on. Okay. So, okay. so when we start thinking about the questions that you just asked, which are just brilliant, just, that was just brilliant. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm smiling because I come, I want to go try this now. So I like, I, it. Use, them, I use them all day it's, and, it's good. and, and it, it works. Okay. And, and, my really good. Are, and my clients are top of the leaderboard in most cases because they're using this. Yeah. Uh, we know why call current clients, call clients that said no. Everybody is different, and people will talk to you. Yeah, well, everybody. They, they and, will and do the, the 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 four Fs. That's it. Well, so so if we think about the five questions that I, I gave you earlier, people mm -hmm. want to know: Do I like you? They're asking this of you. Do I like you? Right. Okay. The easiest way to be likable is to listen. Right. I mean, if you think about it, the most unlikable human being in your life is the person who is standing in front of you talking about themselves, right? So, the, so do you listen to me? Do you make me feel important? The most insatiable human need is the need to feel important. When people are telling you their story, because those, those, those Fs, right, those four Fs, that's getting them to tell you their story, which right. is nonlinear. What's the first time you did this? Like, I was just thinking, like, the first time I got on the airplane, you know, I was like, the, it was, I forgot how to do it. I, right. I didn't remember how to fly anymore. And so it's you know, a brilliant question. And, and, and so they begin telling you their story. When they tell right. you their story, like they're teaching you their language. Yeah. Okay, let's go back to diversity. If we went back to the 1980s, 70s, 60s, 50s, right? And you were in sales. Mm -hmm. It was dominated by white men who mm -hmm. were all dressed in the same suit, all looked right. exactly together. So we all looked exactly the way we, we, the other person looked. It was easy. Right. Because human beings, this is bias, right? We have something called the similarity bias. The mm -hmm. similarity bias is we have a tendency as human beings. This is baked deep in our DNA for lots of reasons to trust people who are like us. It's right. just basic. OK, it's called a bias because it's not true. It's just what we tell ourselves in our brain, which is why we create microaggressions and all the little things that we do, sometimes consciously, sometimes unconsciously. Right. When I'm teaching salespeople, I'm like, you don't get to choose the people that you sell to. I mean, if you're choosing the people you sell to, you're probably broke, right? So, and the people that you sell to probably don't look like you. And it's right. not just, it's not just race, it's their age, right? So a lot of times I got a 24 year old selling to a 55 year old business person. You or have a different, you have a are, different selling to a 24 year old. Exactly. So you've got, you've got all of this, all of these people that are just, just, they're different from each other. Right. We know that trust matters, right? So do I trust and like you? And so back in the days when we were selling to people who looked just like us, that was an easy thing. Like trust was, we didn't have to get through the you're not like me issue in order to have the trust. These days we got that going on and we work really hard to get past those biases, but they're still there. But think about this. The reason that if you've ever traveled, I know you have because of your background right. and you've been to another country and you try to speak the language. As soon as you try to speak the language, they go, oh, come on. And no, right. and no matter where I am, if I'm, you know, if I'm training and I'm you know, delivering training for a software group in Russia or I'm in China or I'm in Malaysia or I'm in Portugal, I always work hard to try to learn part of the language before I go on. And as soon as I try, I'm in because right. I because I sound like them. Right. Yep. So think about it. When people are telling you their story the first time they did this, they're teaching you their language and they're sharing and, the experience. Exactly. I'm trusting you, they're sharing. They're, and, they're, and, they are. And, and, and I listening. tell people that. I say, I say, I said, well, tell me so I can feel, I understand your experience. What was it really like the first time? Ex that that's exactly right. Now, right. The the question they're asking is, do you get me in my problems? Right. And most of right. the time, you're selling to someone who is using somebody else's money to solve their problems, their right. problems, their issues. The first time, all of those things. That's part of their language of who they are, what they want. So now when you're having that conversation, you talk about the solutions part, the business case part, you're not using your language. You're, you're talking about you. You're talking about them. You come back and say, you know, you told me this, 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 and this. Here's what we do. Or when you were walking me through the problem that you were having with your employee over here or the issues that you're having in your warehouse or the problems that you're having, you know, on the road. And this is why you need this particular software. When you start doing that, 
all of the the natural barriers that we find ourselves in because we're not we're not we don't look like each other or we're you know we're from the same age group it all goes away because suddenly you're speaking their language and you're able to tap into that similarity bias and make people feel like you totally get them and when you when they feel that way they're much more likely to step into it to lean into it and to start paying attention to you when there's a point where you have to like sometimes you got to say this is what I think we should do here's a recommendation right but you're solutioning with them so if they yes. see the problem and they told you where they want to go you're not selling you're solutioning with them and so yeah you lean in they lean in yep. it, it, it it it's collaborative and that's what so it goes back to what you said if you're empathetic if I trust you if you listen to me and you understand my experience I'm going to collaborate with you and it becomes it becomes such an easy sell and so that's 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 what post pandemic selling is connection well, it, it sounds to me like what you're saying though is that it's not what you sell it's how you sell that's it it doesn't matter what you're selling it is connect with people it is relationship it is collaborate and it's exactly what you said i wanted to chuckle when you started saying well it, it's about empathy Yes, Jeb, it's all about empathy. It is being present with somebody, wherever so they are. Let's, I want to take a step back and I want to talk about um, uh, insecurity. Okay. So I, I, you were talking about the trucking world. So the logistics and trucking industry is a place where I've got a big client base. Okay. And the, the executives in those particular industries are working really, really, really hard because it's been, traditionally been a male-dominated space to 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 bring more women in in particular like in just because they recognize that it's holding them back not to have that level of diversity in their organizations so the the, the classes of salespeople that I'm teaching now are are getting more and more diverse so when I first started working in the industry say 10 years ago like if you know if there like you said if there was a woman in the room she was the only <laughs> woman in the room and she was a total trailblazer yeah. and today you know I'll be in a room and like half the class will be women which is awesome except for one thing the customer base is still all men. And in a lot of cases, they're gruffy men who have been doing this for a long time. And they, you know, they're in an industry that's tough and tumble and they got all the language. And, and so almost invariably, uh, uh, you know, one of the, the students will ask me, OK, well, you know, I'm in a situation and, you know, the the you know, the 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 man that I'm selling to basically, you know, dismisses me. You don't know anything about trucks. You don't know anything about logistics. You know, I want to talk to somebody else. And it's that maybe they're not saying it explicitly, although it's right. happened a couple of times where I've said that they really say that to you. And they went, yeah, yes, I'm like, they do. Oh, you're freaking kidding me. No, they do. <laughs> it, so, it happens. Yeah. <laughs> so so. I know what I say to people, like I like when I'm trying to teach someone in that industry what to do. I'm interested in what your take is. So if someone says, "Hey, I'm I'm out on you know I'm out on a call and I'm right. selling and you know it's me and it's uh you know it's a business owner or what have you," and I and they start either treating me that way or I just feel that way, and and that insecurity kills you. Like when it comes to you know building your business case, advancing the sale, asking for the next thing especially for people who are high, highly empathetic, the moment that you start to feel insecure, you forget about asking for the next step and that'll, that kind of that causes your deals to stall. So I'm really interested in that because I think when we combine empathy with outcome, like the ability to advance to the next step, that matters. But like, it's hard when you feel like you don't belong there or when someone makes you feel that way. How do you advise your clients and you coach your clients to stand on their feet and be present in those moments and 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 like demand their right to be there at the table with that person as so, an equal. Yeah. So so um so I so I think demanding the right is so let me tell you, Jeff, I just tell them I say choose kindness. Okay. Usually when somebody's doing that, they are you have intimidated them. They are feeling insecure. So I encourage if given a choice between right and kind, choose kindness. And I always talk about just be kind. You have to remember that this man is somebody's father, somebody's grandfather, somebody's uncle, somebody's dad, and treat him the way you would want your gruff grandfather treated. Treat them the way you would want your gruff father treated. And I usually defer, and I would say, you're absolutely right. But you know what? This is what you have. So can I just ask you a couple questions, Jim? And I would just, I would just be kind. And I would just say, you know, the, I would just, I would start with my, my four Fs and I would say, you know, so I know you're in the trucking and you're doing this and, 
gosh, what did the pan, you know, what was it like the first time you got in your truck with the pandemic? If you are kind to somebody, they will shift. And, you know, and you have to tell them, I agree with them. I don't demand that I need to be, I just shift and I just, I just, but I'm just kind. And I treat them just like I would like my grandfather. My grandfather would be just like that. And so how would you talk to your grandfather? How would you talk to your father if he was like that? I would just, I would just be kind and I would keep right on with my same questions. And I would nod and say, you're absolutely right. But let me just ask you these questions. So my manager doesn't yell at me when I get back or whatever. I'm going to ask you these questions. We're going to laugh. I tell a joke. I'd make them laugh. And, and then once they're laughing, they're going to connect with you. And once they connect with you, they forget what color you are, what sex you are. They just forget. They just, they see you as a person. So I'm glad we're, you are in our instinct. So I, you know, I, the first thing I say to people is like when someone challenges you that way, it kicks off a low level fight or flight. So, and you're going to feel that emotion. You can't choose the emotion. You can choose your response. Right. So you've got to rise above that and choose your response. So I just use, I, I'd like use, like you, like you said, I just relate to them. I'll just say, you're exactly right. You probably know more about this and your little pinky than I'll ever know in my lifetime. And that's exactly why I'm here to ask you questions. So it's my, my best advice is respond with a joke, like, you know, like, like in such situ- depending on the situation, like you gotta, you gotta you know, know the person you're dealing with, but if someone challenges you, you go, what are you afraid? You think a girl's going to mo- know more than you? And like, they'll always laugh when you do that because they realize that what they said, they didn't really mean to say that they just don't know how to communicate another way. So that's what they do. Or they're intimidated. Yeah. And, they're, yeah, and they're, they're, yeah, they are intimidated. Up. They're putting their defense up. And so you have to get that defense down with either humor or kindness. And, and, and I love the kindness piece because what, what I know to be true is that people have a tendency to respond in kind. So, so if you want to be in control of the conversation, you respond in a way that pulls them toward you versus you moving toward them. So if you respond right. with aggression, right, or you respond and you get mad or you get insecure or you, you know, if you lean into them, then suddenly they're in control of the conversation. So typically you want to respond with a non-complimentary behavior. And the easiest one is relax a sort of confidence and you agree with them. You're right. And, and all of a sudden, all the winds out of their sail and you're back in charge. So very, very good. That's I'm glad that I'm giving good advice. So that's that that's one. So so let's let's jump into post pandemic. Okay. So we've we've talked a little bit about um, about empathy. We talked about connecting. Uh, one of the things that I'm finding is that I'm doing like before the pandemic and I've always been a virtual sales organization. So my salespeople have always sold that way. And by the way, my top two salespeople are women and they crush everybody else, just so we're clear on that. Um, and they're good. Um, but the uh, but the but we've always been virtual. The thing is, is that before the pandemic, I would say that 80 percent of our calls were on the phone, like our sales calls would all be by the phone. Post pandemic, 95 percent are on video, like yeah. we're almost no no phones. McKinsey said that when when uh, when they asked buyers, they asked buyers what they preferred when it was a choice between a phone and a video call, buyers unanimously said video. When I ask salespeople, salespeople all tell me that their buyers don't want to get on video. So when you look at the data points, I'm like, the, the salespeople are wrong. But let's talk about connecting real quickly. One of the things that I found is that you and I, we spent a few minutes on the phone together and we're talking on video, I say a video or video call, and I've never right. met you before. It's the very first time. And it's taken a few minutes to sort of for the two of us to kind of get into a sync where right. we're smiling and laughing and there's, you know, the guards down just a little bit. And, 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 but what I found is that the second time we get on and the third time we get on and the fourth time we get on, I have, I have shorter, but more calls with people. The more video calls I get, the more we forget that we're on video, like the right. more it just becomes natural. Mm-hmm. So, so with, with that in mind, can you, can you walk me through some trends and things that you're seeing for salespeople post pandemic around connecting and what you're advising your, your, your clients and the people that you're coaching to change about their behavior and their mindset when it comes to connecting with people using this type of technology. So I, so I, I always tell them plan on come camera ready. Okay. Wake up in the morning thinking camera ready, wake up in the morning, come out of your sweat, you know, do your hair, do whatever you need to do, be camera ready. Because, you know, even if, even if you say, even if you do a Zoom call and the client doesn't turn the camera on, I, you know, I tell them to ask them, say, you know what? I don't care what you look like. Let's just, you know, we're, we're, we're all working from home. We're not connecting. Let's just connect, turn your camera on. Just be, be present with them, be, uh, be vulnerable and, and turn your camera on. 
If your dog walks past, hey, there's my dog. If your child climbs up on your lap, introduce the child. You know, I have I have a, I have a client who's, whose daughter was three years old, got up on the table behind her and could see herself on the screen and took her clothes off and was dancing around <laughs> naked. And she was sitting there. Mom was horrified at first and all of the, every, the she's talking to this team. And then finally she's like, that's my daughter. She introduced her. She told her daughter, jump down, go get your jammies on and, and went back to selling. We're all dealing with that. So be real. And and what what I mean, can you imagine how incredible it is to invite your clients into your home? How many clients could you sell if you can invite all your clients into your home? Well, that's Zoom is. It is an opportunity. So look at it that way. Treat them that way. Um, you know, make them feel comfortable. And, and so that's what I talk about is um, I say people are not people talk about Zoom fatigue. I said people aren't tired of Zoom. People are tired of every Zoom call starting with. Oh, the pandemic is horrible. How are you? How, you know, isn't this horrible? That's what they're tired of. I said, make your Zoom calls engaging. Make them something that people look forward to. You want them to look in the calendar and say, oh, I'm meeting with Jeb today. This is so cool. I love talking with Jeb. That's what you want to be. Um, and so I just, so that's what I say is just, if you approach it as an incredible opportunity, your clients will. If you're positive enough to beat about it, your clients will. And yes, clients want Zooms because they wanna connect with people. So many people are either living by themselves or not connecting with their family and friends. And the only way they can connect is through Zoom. And so I think salespeople have to change their, their thought about it. You, can, you can't hide behind the phone anymore. No. And I, I, I agree with you. So I wrote a book called Virtual Selling and I, my, I have this one big ammunition in virtual selling, always be video ready. When yeah. I come in in the morning, I'm mic'd up. And I, I get up, I get up, I put, I dress like I'm supposed to dress in the office and I'm on video all day long. Some days I'm on video eight hours a day and, but I'm mic'd up and video ready. And by the way, if they're not on video, I'm on video and I'm awesome. And I'm always going to be awesome. And what happens that what I've found is that if, if I'm on multiple calls with people and the first time I'm on video, they're not on video. The second time we're on, they'll be on video. Yeah. And, and I, or I will tell them, I'll say, I'll say, I'll say, I don't care. You know, join me. They'll say, oh, I haven't done my hair today. And I go, that's okay. On Fridays, I don't do my hair either. And I was like, so next time we meet, we'll meet on a Friday. We both won't do our hair. You know, I make a joke about it. And they go, not today, Cheryl. I said, great. I'd love to see you next time. You're right. The next time their camera is on. Yep. All my clients are on video. I mean, I just, they just, that's just what they do. Yep. And, and like I said, one of the, the best things that I learned is look at it like you're welcoming them into your home. Be there early. Don't make somebody sit in your waiting room. People, that is horrible making somebody sit in your waiting room. They get nervous, they get anxious. And don't ever say, oh, I got to, you know, give yourself 15 minutes between appointments. Oh, it was great. Drop real quickly. Let them drop. Say goodbye. Have a great weekend. You know, just, just like you walk somebody to the door at your house. And so I just think a little bit of Zoom etiquette um, makes all the difference in the world. Well, it's also giving people a great emotional experience. So what we know to be true is that the buyer's emotional experience while they're working with you is a more consistent predictor of outcome of any other variable in the sales continuing process. So when people have a better emotional experience on you with in Zoom, they're going to be much more willing to move to the next meeting, which will likely be in Zoom, which is in your favor because you can have a lot more sales meetings on a video than you possibly can driving around in your car. So it opens up the door for you to put a lot more in your pipeline, which means that you're going to boost your income. What other trends are you seeing as we as we move towards the tail end of the pandemic and we're coming out on the other side? What I'm hearing from my clients is they are not going to go back right away to, to traveling. So not just cars, but planes. So you think about, you know, you go out and see a client. If you were traveling on a plane, that's a whole day loss. So how many clients can you can you book up between there? Um, I think that. Um, anything that you can do to help customers be more productive virtually, uh, if you're selling software, anything um, that everything that um, I'm reading is that, you know, a big companies, certain departments are never going back. They're going to be working from home forever so that we need to be able to get comfortable. We need to get good at selling virtually and that we need to understand that a lot of our clients may never go back to the office. They may always be working virtually. So I think that that's important is that you become, you just master your ability to sell virtually. You master your ability, ability to, serve, to, um, to sell on Zoom. Um, so Yeah, so I think, I think a couple of things that I'm seeing is that one, I believe there's going to be a massive explosion of innovation coming on the other side of the pandemic. And so 
And we're already starting to see that. So I think for salespeople in particular, it's going to be your ability to go out and find that technology and adopt it and become adept at it uh, in your world, adapting it to how you're working. I think that's I think that's critical. So you can't just be you know stuck in time. I think for any salesperson that was caught flat-footed last year, a year ago, when we were going through this, that that you, if you didn't learn that lesson, you need to be ready for what's coming next. That may not be another global pandemic, but it's going to be something that's going to change. So, and you said something super important, and this is my message to salespeople. You need to master every communication channel because the future of selling is something called blending. And I wrote about this in virtual selling. And mm-hmm. that is that this for the salesperson, it's choosing the communication channel that meets the buyer where they are at any given place in the sales process that gives you the highest probability of getting your desired sales outcome at the lowest cost of time, energy, and money. So it's really about efficiency and effectiveness. So it's, it's some cases, a video calls the right thing to do. In other cases, a text message is the right thing to do. In some cases, it's direct messaging. I've got a big practice. Uh, my company's got a big practice in India. So it's not uncommon for me to text one of my clients in India and then end up in like a back and forth conversation with them and th- then the overlap between you know our two time zones. And then suddenly I'm in a video call. Like that's why, like you used to, you talk about, you got to be camera ready. Like there's so many times when I'm sitting there and I, I'm, later the night ago, I'm, I'm on the phone with, with the CEO of one of my biggest clients and we end up on FaceTime in my kitchen. Now, mm-hmm. you know, I really, my, my wife gets mad when I invite my clients in our house because it's a disaster because we're working all the time. But, you know, I'm sitting there and there's food everywhere and whatever, you know, but and nobody. But how cool is that? But how was, cool is it yeah. that you welcome them into your home? Yeah. And, that, and that's, and that's why I tell people, I go, so, I mean, so what they see your dogs or your kids or your spouse, you have welcomed them into your home. That Talk about connecting. They are connecting. Um, you know, so I, I think that that's critical. I think social media is the other one, okay? You know, I still have clients who are afraid of LinkedIn or Twitter. And I say it doesn't matter. You have to connect with people on social media. Social media, I, I just, just like you said, when you go to a foreign country, you learn that language. I tell people it's just like on social media. You need to learn the social media mm-hmm. language and you need to be able to speak it. You have to be in social media. I think just like you have, just like, just like you sell and you connect with people, you have to be able to do that. I think it's yeah, I, of- I agree. And I think, and I think teaching, teaching salespeople that social media is nuanced. It is part about your, it's part of your personal brand, but more than anything, it's about, it's about building familiarity. So when we talk about a video call, so again, I'll just go back to when we first started this call. So you and I never met each other before. Right. We hopped on and like it's instantly like we're looking at each other and we're we're just trying to figure out like who are you and who am I? I get that, right? Now we're like, we're gonna be hanging out in each other's kitchens here really soon. You know, you never know. So, but but the thing about the call is that the longer we've we've talked to each other, the more familiar we are. The more familiar right. we are, you know, it's a little bit easier to talk. That's what I like about social media. Social media helps you build familiarity, familiarity for who you are, your message, your face, um, you know, the, the just seeing you over and over again, videos, all those type of things. It also helps you build some obligation because if I like and, and share the things that you're posting, you feel a little bit of obligation. But that familiarity is a big deal. Because if I've seen your face before and we hop on a call together, right. suddenly those barriers that are a little bit longer, they take longer on a video call than, than on in person. They, we compress that and suddenly it feels like we know each other. Yeah. So you got to be there. Absolutely. I, I recently was talking to an SVP of sales and I connected with him on LinkedIn and found out that he was a Naval Academy grad. Well, my daughter is an Air Force Academy grad and her partner is a Naval Academy grad. Well, it took us about this long to connect. Yeah. All I had to say was, you know, uh, so in my family, when the Navy, Army, you know, when Navy and Air Force play, um, I have to be careful because I, you know, who I'm rooting for. And he was like, what? And I go, you know, and I told him and I'm telling you, it was like it was old. It was like old home week. OK. Yeah. And so so but because I went on social media, because I connected with him on LinkedIn, because I took the time to read his profile and looked at his badges and he has an Air Force badge. I mean, a Navy badge. That was an instant connection. And so. This, you can re- learn so much about people by what they post, what they like, what they write about. Um, and I teach my clients to immerse themselves, immerse themselves in their customer's world. Read about them. See, read what they're posting. Just learn about them. It's just like anyone else that if you, if you wanted to spend time getting to know somebody, read about them, find out about them. You're not driving. You're not flying. You're not sitting in an airport. Use your downtown and find out about your clients. 
And it, it will help with that connection. We ha- everybody has a connection somewhere. Find it. Ooh. Now we're going to end on that because that was good. Okay. Everybody's got a connection somewhere. Find it. You're ex- that's oh, it. man, that was that's that's gold that needs to be on a T-shirt. I like that so much. <laughs> All right. So tell us, tell our audience where okay. they can find your book and where they can find out more about you and what you do. Okay, so first of all, you can find my book on Amazon. It is this, right now. It is moving up on the bestseller list for number one book in business. Um, we're up moving up there. But the book's website is postpandemicselling.com. Very easy, postpandemicselling.com. You can find the book there or on Amazon. You can find me at masterfulselling.com and, and also sistersinsales.com. That's S-I-S-T-A-S in sales.com. If you have a company and you're looking at and you want to add diversity, you want to add black and brown women to your sales force, go to sistersandsales.com, click on the partnership tab, and it will it will drop, um, send you our brochure and give you a chance to link with me. I, we can jump on a Zoom call and I can tell you all about Sisters and Sales and what I do. Buy the book if you want to learn how to connect and be empathetic with your clients. Beautiful. Shirley, thank you, thank you so much for thank having me. I mean, this has been an awesome conversation. I'm so glad that you came to the Sales Gravy Podcast. I was almost said, thank you for having me on your podcast. I feel like I've been on your podcast. <laughs> thank you so much for being thank on you. my podcast, on the Sales Gravy Podcast. It's been amazing. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Well, it was a great conversation. I hope it inspires you to go out, leverage your empathy, connect with other people, and try Cheryl's four Fs. And make sure that you go check out Vidyard. Vidyard is the easiest, fastest way to stand out among your competitors by using video messages that are personalized for your prospect and help you show your personality. And you can try Vidyard for free. That's absolutely free at vidyard.com forward slash salesgravy. That's vidyard.com forward slash salesgravy.